Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna welcome everyone who's here today um, joining us for our Graduate Group in Education PhD Colloquium Seminar Series. In this series, we are um, celebrating lifting the work of our PhD students uh, in the graduate, school, graduate Group in Education who are done and or are about to be done with this huge accomplishment um, to, to complete their, their PhD programs. I am Danny C. Martinez. I'm an associate professor in language literacy and culture and also chair of the graduate group in education. This is week eight of such a long year of such a, um, a quarter that uh, uh, the end of a quarter where many of us are feeling um, the intensity of the year, the, of the pandemic, of the racial reckoning, fires that happened that devastated our community. So I just really wanna thank you all for being here. Um, today, I wanna to welcome folks from all over the the globe actually. I'm seeing that we have folks here from all over the region, Davis, Sacramento area. We have folks here from, in, um, from listening in and joining us from Barcelona, Texas. And I wanna give a shout out to the Chicago community that's here to support Vanessa Segundo. Um, bienvenidos a la familia Segundo que están aquí para apoyar a la doc soon to be doctora Segundo. So I wanna um, really thank you and, and welcome you all to this um, virtual seminar series. I wanna pass it on to la doctora Marcela Cuellar who, will, uh, who has the privilege of, of introducing Vanessa Segundo to us today. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Martinez mentioned, I'm um, Marcela Cuellar and I have the distinct honor and privilege of being Vanessa's um, primary advisor and dissertation chair. And so I've gotten to know her work very intimately over the last seven years. Uh, Vanessa and I actually met first when she enrolled in my 2014 class when I was starting off here at UC Davis, um, looking at issues of access and equity. And from there, she was really focused on looking at retention, understanding current retention theories, uh, specifically for Latinx students. But I could already tell at that time that she was really going to be pushing the field of higher education in these very important ways to think about Latinx students more intentionally and how can we more authentically serve this student population. And this really stems from her deep practitioner knowledge as a student affairs practitioner uh, from Illinois. I know she's Illinois. I know she's proud, a proud native of Chicago. And um, it's been quite an honor to work with her as her advisor and also to collaborate with her on a publication and create something together and really based on the assets of Latinx students and thinking about how do we create institutions that truly better support these students. From the moment that Vanessa arrived at UC Davis, she has demonstrated her strong leadership and deep practitioner knowledge and really the ways that she can build her scholarship and her practice together to really transform and support student success. And during her time here, she has advocated for students through various GSRs, working with the AB 540 Center, the Center for Chicanx, Latinx Academic Student Success, and now the Women's Resource Center. So she's really left her mark at UC Davis. And I know she's also doing incredible work with the Transformative Justice and Education Center over the last few years, and really has provided her leadership uh, to our university in service of the students that are currently here and the generations that will follow. And as you'll learn from her dissertation work, it really builds on this uh, passion that she has for creating more just systems of higher education. And so as part of her research her agenda, her dissertation focuses on race-specific cultural centers in post-secondary environments, because we know that these spaces aim to enhance students of color sense of belonging, develop their academic and personal talents, as well as support their retention. And so these centers really play a, a, a transformative role in the lives of so many Latinx students. And in the UC system, we've had some centers historically serve this role. However, in the last decade, we've seen more of our campuses develop these centers and uh, including on our own campus in the last five years. And so despite the growing adoption of this institutional practice that we've seen even within our own system, there has been relatively little research on these centers. And so Vanessa's qualitative dissertation uniquely documents the history of these centers within UC and the various contributions that these um, centers uh, contribute to student success, but also really portrays the individuals in these spaces, both the practitioners who are leading these spaces 
and the students who are engaging uh, in, in the various forms of learning within these spaces. I can tell you having read her full dissertation, it is an impressive work of art. It is an impressive call to action. And I just want to mention that her work is so impressive um, that she did receive support from the Ford Foundation Fellowship for this work, being the first in the School of Education to receive this honor. And I know she said she will not be the last as well. And I know that she's continuing to support uh, current students. And that's who Vanessa is. She uh, walks the walk of being an equity-minded a scholar and practitioner. And so it's been my absolute pleasure to work with her and witness her scholarly development. And I've learned so much. So please join me in welcoming her to this week's PhD student colloquium. Thank you so much, Dr. Akoyer. I think on that note, we can just end the presentation on a high note. <laughs> Go from there. <laughs> Uh, but again, you know, thank you, everyone. You know, let me go ahead and just begin by sharing. Uh, but again, I sincerely do appreciate the love and support that y'all are sharing through the chat, through your presence of just being here. It really does mean so much to me. Um, so let me go. There we go. Okay. All right, y'all. So first and foremost, thank you all for taking the time and energy to be in attendance today. I sincerely hope that your families and you are well as we navigate a global pandemic and racial violence across, across the country. My name is Vanessa Segundo. I'm currently a PhD candidate in the School of Education at UC Davis. I use she, her pronouns. My presentation, We're Not Here for a Photo Op, Engineering Latinx Student Success, reflects my commitment to work towards justice, seeking equity-oriented understanding of Latinx futures. Before I begin, I want to take a moment to thank my community for your infinite support, time, and prayers. To my parents and siblings, y'all made the impossible possible to ensure that my love for learning was nurtured and that my confidence as a chingona was unwavering. Um, they're actually all here today, so round of applause for all of you coming through. Um, papi y mami, muchas gracias por siempre recordarme que por el simple hecho de ser su hija, estaba destinada a ser algo más grande y poderoso en la vida. A mi esposo y mis hijos, Estoy infinitamente agradecida con ustedes. Mami, les mando un abrazo muy fuerte por ser comprensibles, flexibles y pacientes. Los amo con todo mi corazón. To my best friend, Shante Randall, thank you for always holding space uh, as we both cried and laughed throughout these past seven years. To my sister scholars, y'all are some bad people. Dr. Bernadette Bestgreen, soon to be Drs. Calzón Mubengsu and Liz Flores, Amber Hernandez, y'all breathe life into this doctoral journey to the incredible student affairs professionals that have invested in me. Thank you. I wanna recognize Cecily and Nelson Alford for humanizing me as a mother scholar. Uh, you taught me to lead and uh, lead and uh, with heart, humor, and astrology. To my TJ family, you taught me to be in community. Doctors Maisha and Tori Wen, Amber, Jeremy, Adam, and Hadari, I see you. To my mentors in the School of Education, thank you for all your support. To my dissertation committee, Drs. Marcela Cuellar, Maisha Wynn, and Susie Cepeda, all present with us today, I sincerely appreciate your words, time, presence, and light. I have grown in ways I have never imagined. To all the students and families who have had the honor of walking and building alongside, this is for you. Now let us shift to my presentation. I invite you to enter this platica as my partner in engaging how I consider my research, a project of recovery, of remembering. I call your attention to the image you see on the screen, a picture of a sign that was in one of the Latinx cultural centers that is part of the study. It reads, remember to eat well, to hydrate, to sleep, to affirm yourself and others, that you are more than what you produce, that you are loved. Let this ground us in these intentions, especially as we come together on this crazy end of the year schedules where indeed the testimonies I am about to share regarding the lived experiences of Latinx student affair professionals are truly a labor of love, not meant to be captured as a performative gesture of institutional serviness through the lens of a photo op. I haven't continued to be intrigued by the following three words, Latinx student success. What is it? How does it feel? Who is responsible for it? Who gets to give and take credit for it? Where is it located? Latinx student success is generally defined and assessed by conventional metrics of enrollment, retention, and graduation. The cute planter displayed on your screen 
also another outer factor way study, helps us visualize el triunfo, the success, symbolized by a graduation cap, diploma, and book in the context of the university. I've heard this term, Latinx student success, over and over again throughout my 12 years of experience as a student affairs professional in areas of diversity and justice, which compels me to think about other ways Latinx students are thriving that we have yet to affirm. Absent from the discourse and assessment of Latinx student success, it is examining and centering the contribution of liberatory student outcomes and Latinx cultural centers, two areas that remain understudied. Thus, I center liberatory student outcomes, which work to help students understand that they are navigating the system and their relationship and history to it. I position Latinx cultural centers as sites of cognitive and spatial justice for Latinx students, as their roots in freedom and liberation are essential to expanding our understanding of Latinx student success. In fact, in April of 1969, over 100 Latinx students, faculty, administrators, and community delegates representing the Northern, Central, and Southern regions of California convened to craft El Plan de Santa Barbara, which outlines the type of higher education they demanded for Latinx communities and the action necessary to accomplish this goal. This 155 page document outlines the following six key demands deemed critical for the success of Latinx students. Number one, strategic enrollment and recruitment of Latinx students, faculty, staff, and administrators. Number two, culturally and linguistically relevant curriculum. Number three, student support services. Four, research programs. And five, publication programs. And six, Latinx cultural centers. These six demands stand the test of time as they continue to be core priority areas for advocating for institutions to serve Latinx students. These futurists, never lost sight of the simple fact that these programs would only be effective to the extent that they could be influenced by decision-making processes led by Latinx students. Their introdu the introduction to this manifesto begins with the following. For all people, as with individuals, the time comes when they must reckon with their history. For the Chicano, the present is a time of, re of renaissance, of renacimiento. Our people and our community, El Barrio and La Colonia, are expressing a new consciousness and a new resolve recognizing the historical task confronting our people and fully aware of the cost of human progress. We pledge our will to move. We will move forward toward our destiny as a people. We will move forward against those forces which have denied us freedom of expression and human dignity. Throughout the history of the quest for cultural expression and freedom has taken the form of struggle. Our struggle tempered by the lessons of the American past is a historical reality. These intellectuals and community organizers were looking towards the future of Latinx students in higher education. They were futurists already planning and providing a design to work towards Latinx student success. I too need to acknowledge the OG futurists in my life as this grounds my orientation to the study I will subsequently describe. I introduce to you my parents, Antonio Aguilar on the left and Maria Martinez on the right. My parents both immigrated to the United States from Guerrero, Mexico, over 40 years ago. They arrived to Chicago, a place that would be home for all our entire family. Here they are pictured during their first few years of arrival, ages 18 and 15 respectively. The value of education was instilled in me at an early age. Obtaining a college degree was an expectation of my family. Because of my parents, I grew up in the best city in the world. Say with me, Chicago in the Humboldt Park and Logan Square neighborhoods, pre-Starbucks, and later on in Cicero. I witnessed a community organizing and an unwavering commitment to create and celebrate brown life. In fact, my entry to school mirrored this experience, being nourished and nurtured to exist in my full humanity. Here is my kindergarten class picture. Ms. Moore pictured on the top left created more than a class. She created an environment of opportunities for my classmates and me to know that our school was exactly that, our school. My undergraduate journey was a complete opposite of my early years in school. I transferred between four different institutions within four years. I started off at Dominican University, then over to DePaul, moving on next to Morton College, and eventually graduating from UIC as a political science major and minor in history. However, I had no time to question the racism, nativism, and other isms I navigated. 
My undergraduate experience was strained by the actions required to complete a degree, and I need to protect myself from susto, soul displacement, that derives from interior migrations, which mirrored my physical displacement across college campuses. I have been on a quest since then to understand how to invest in and transform the lives of Latinx students who, like me, navigate a system not meant for us to thrive. My doctoral education and training provided me with a critical interdisciplinary lens by which to interrogate Latinx student success, while also positioning me to celebrate culturally grounded theories and practices that advance the possibility and urgency for alternative futures for Black and Brown communities. Pictured here are the scholars who inspired my work. Doctors Gloria Lanton Billings, Sean Harper, Maisha Wynn, and Bettina Love provide me with theoretical frameworks that humanize, celebrate, and plan for the future of minoritized communities. The work of doctors Dolores Delgado Bernal, Laura Rendon, Tara Yoso, and Susi Cepeda represent the Chicana feminist epistemologies, which providing with the language to name and center Latinx experiences in educational research. Doctors Marcela Cuellar and Gina Garcia's groundbreaking work on Hispanic student institutions remind me to move the needle on the concept of serviness in relation to student outcomes. Also inspired by the work of Estela Bentimon, in which she details, I quote, five principles that provide the architecture that leaders and practitioners need to build equity by design to enact education reform in higher education. I would like us to think how, uh, I would like to first um, invite us to think about universities as a system and how it was built by equity in equity by design. For instance, let us acknowledge its roots in settler, settler colonialism and a whiteness. To do his extensive social historical analysis, Wilder explains how the first five colleges in the British American colonies including Harvard, Will and Mary, Yale, and Princeton were, quote, instruments of Christian expansionism, weapons for the conquest of indigenous peoples and major beneficiaries of the African slave trade and slaver. In fact, several universities were the beneficiaries of land endowments that were gifted by wealthy merchants who had direct ties to post-secondary institutions. Universities facilitated colonial campaigns by their movement to evangelize and, quote, educate indigenous peoples albeit through terrorism and genocide. Fiscal operations which were rooted in the revenue of slavery and the reproduction of the elite white male class of sons and the prosperity to replace their forefathers, wealthy merchants, slaveholders, and plantation owners. In fact, 19 years after Harvard University opened its doors to the first inaugural class, they established the Indian College in 1655 to formalize the Christian education of indigenous students. Indigenous children were forcefully enrolled in the Indian College through the encouragement of college administrators who, quote, recruited indigenous children from friendly or enemy nations by, quote, invitation, purchase, or kidnapping. Secondly, universities were not forecasting changes in student demographics we are witnessing today. Let's take, for instance, the Latinx population as an example. Excelente in Education notes that 18% of the total US population is, uh, is uh, Latinx, and 25% of the total population is part of the K-12 population. Furthermore, the Latinx population in general is expected to increase by 25% by 2030. California is already ahead of this curve with more than 40% of the total population identifying as Latinx, representing 52% of the total K-12 population. It is no surprise that Latinx student success initiatives are gaining traction nationwide. However, the current trend by which to define and assess for Latinx student success is by turning to data trends regarding enrollment, retention, and graduation rates that, while informative, have yet to capture the full experience of Latinx students. Ironically, these data points actually show that while more Latinx students are being admitted into colleges, largely at the community college level, we are unable to have major impact on their college completion. Thus, what I am aiming to do is really interact Latinx student success by looking at liberatory student outcomes and Latinx cultural centers. We're really thinking about one, what is the importance of Latinx uh, liberatory student outcomes in deconstructing and dismantling the Eurocentric paradigm? And secondly, looking at, again, the social spatial justice uh, implied and represented by Latinx cultural centers. Thus, I conducted a two-year-long two-year long qualitative multi-site case study of the six Latinx cultural centers in the UC system, attending to one, 
the history of each center, conducting the archival review and physical, physically documenting characteristics of, this, of each center. Secondly, learning about the practices and paradigms employed by each of the center's directors. And finally, examining one academic course offered by one of the centers to understand what students were learning from, what Rich, what Rich Milner describes as a null curriculum. For the context of today, I'll be sharing aspects of my work with the center directors. For the past year, I spent time interviewing six Latinx cultural center directors employed at Research One Universities, three of which were HSIs and three were emerging HSIs. I addressed the following research question. What practices and paradigms do Latinx student affair professionals exercise to support Latinx students? In using critical race theory and critical race spatial analysis to frame the study, I was keen to position Latinx cultural centers as more than a mere backdrop to educational equity. They are crucial to understanding social, temporal, and spatial systems that mitigate the environments Latinx students and staff navigate. I adhere to the five principles of Chicana Latina Feminist Platica methodology to guide my research design, data collection, and data analysis processes. I grounded my approach to the study within the intuition of my participants and my own. Secondly, I position participants as producers of knowledge in the study. Directors engage in theoretical conversations about the state of Latinx student success, naming, interrogating, and amplifying critiques about the role of Latinx cultural centers and important institutional decision-making processes. In fact, many of the directors took up my offer during interviews to co-construct and co-deconstruct the interview questions I posed. Thirdly, I employed qualitative methods to understand and make interpretations of how participants constructed of their meaning of their lived realities. The nature of qualitative research required me to acknowledge that one truth can never be captured, thus honoring the existence of multiple realities. Four, directors and, uh, were referred to their K-12 schooling experiences and how this was rooted in an assimilationist agenda. This included a privileging of a deficit-based curriculum that centered whiteness, physical and psychological injury implicated by their school teachers, and peer aggression they experienced the othering of their bodies. It was difficult for them to process out loud as it, was, as it was difficult for me to hear. I affirmed what they shared with me, cried alongside them, rejoiced feverishly, and I made the time to allow them to process what they offered. While not, e and while not each interview or point of data collection was cathartic, I did open myself and the study to be a moment in time for participants to let go of that which no longer served them by transporting moments of harm into the study. Lastly, I did not seek to capture truth through my research, but rather invited uh, the process of understanding my relationship to other directors. All six directors are first-generation college students and subsequently first-generation professionals. While five of the six administrators had completed or were in the progress of completing their doctoral degrees, none expressed a desire to enter the professoriate and instead described several instances when they felt they had been pushed out of the tiny track faculty route. Three of the six directors were responsible for establishing the centers, often building from other experiences as campus alumni. I used the coding software to conduct my analysis of interviews. The responses from interviews were first examined by applying inductive coding techniques to identify emerging themes which, uh, within each individual interview and then across the collection of interviews. Here you can see 24 codes and their frequency in the initial phases of coding. And here is a visual representation of the way in which I cross-examined codes between participants, noting the codes they shared in commonality, represented by those circles in the middle, and the differences in experiences noted by the left and right vertical rows of circles and codes. Five themes on liberatory practice as exercised and embodied by participants emerged from this coding process. Kinship, language, healing, networks, and infrastructure. I draw your attention to the elements of infrastructure. Directors demonstrate a foresight in understanding that their centers they administered required the contribution of resources and services that not only attended to the present needs of students, but also contributed towards the creation of new systems. Directors engineered infrastructure that was politically rooted and culturally informed that leveraged asset-based frameworks to not only help students succeed academically, but also heal from the harm they experience on campus. Five key areas of infrastructure were referenced throughout interviews, alumni networks, academic and research opportunities, funding, community partnerships, and reclassification of their positions and their centers. 
I'll be focusing on the first two alumni networks and academic and research opportunities. Participants express the importance of leveraging the political currency of alumni in institutional advocacy efforts and decision-making processes. Participants noted that when they build relationships with students, it is with the intention that it is a lifelong relationship, not bound by their time at the university. All participants confirmed that their alumni wanted to remain actively involved with campus through their centers, as noted by one of the participants who stated, that's why I like working with alumni, because students need to see themselves in alums to see what they may be in the future. At the same time, alumni want to give back. And I say, fine, you give me back como una plática o dinero, lo que quieres, but just give me something back. So it meshes, it works, and it helps the whole machinery work. For participants, relationality did not end with college graduation. The purpose was for students to thrive, graduate, and return to campus as alumni to help build capacity and strengthen the legacy of center's work. In fact, the majority of support, uh, for example, volunteers, internship pathways, mentorship opportunities, and external funding for centers came through alumni, who as participants noted, considered the center, not the institution as their home away from home. This type of collaboration was facilitated by the credibility and rapport of, of the directors themselves. It should be noted that four of the six directors were alumni. Secondly, Alumni represented a cohort of professionals in a myriad of fields with distinct levels of status and power who collectively were a driving force in university alumni initiatives and interactions. Participants described how alumni relations paralleled the undergraduate experience. The, un the institution was not prepared to deal with the politically oriented group. When knew the stakes were high, they were unable to solidify relationships with them. Participants leveraged both the orientation of Latinx alumni groups and their power as described by themselves, to chair respective Latinx alumni associations. Participants also share several examples of how alumni were central in their ability to advocate for their involvement in decision-making processes linked to Latinx student success and HSI initiatives. Thirdly, alumni represented a central platform for participants to involve their students in seeing their future selves, as noted in the quote. Participants recall the powerful moment when students would meet alumni who were in their same field of interest, often representing the first, the only, or in the few in their career. According to participants, the excitement students shared is partly since they got to meet a Latinx professional with a shared struggle story, who inspired and in some cases offered to mentor them. Furthermore, participants' contribution as scholars was undermined by their limited ability to include the academic and research pathways their centers created as part of the larger discourse of academic excellence at their institutions. While participants were able to create academic courses for university credits through their centers and in partnerships with academic departments, this work was deemed tangent tangential to the responsibilities they were evaluated on. While participants held no academic appointments, they were quick to create opportunities for academic credit for students at their centers. Chavala explained the reason why. My goal is to put students in a situation for them to succeed and feel comfortable and feel validated in fields and strengthen that with each other because that's how white supremacy reproduces itself. It questions your scholarly identity. How many times have we not felt like we didn't belong here academically? We're not smart enough. We shouldn't be here. That's at the heart of coloniality. Who can speak? Who can't speak? Centers established courses, research positions, and internships where students could earn academic credit. They cut it towards a degree completion while engaging in meaningful learning environments. As demonstrated in the center instructor course I observed, Students not only learned about campus resources and experiences deemed critical to their success, but also received messages and signals regarding how to play the game, learning how to do college as Latinx students. In sum, directors operated in and were oriented towards the future of Latinx students by creating infrastructures that nurtured, nourished, and celebrated relationality. While the infrastructure they created worked within the system of higher education, Director's priority was not investing in institutional transformation, which many noted was a flawed effort. Instead, directors were invested in investing in students and creating systems that move beyond the bounds of the academy. To do this work, directors engage in liberatory practices and paradigms, which counter the harm they themselves experience and continue to be replicated in higher education. Directors showed that the practice was a paradigm and the paradigm was a practice. This study understands Latinx cultural centers from the perspectives of directors, charged with leading them within a system that was inherently not designed for their existence, while striving to empower students to engage higher education as a system for them to navigate with intention and strategy. 
the existence of Latinx cultural centers and the work of directors remind us that universities are not willing and ready to create the conditions and policies necessary to engage in the systemic dismantling of whiteness in higher education. The future of Latinx cultural centers is a port for understanding a critical dimension of the future of Latinx student success, relationality. During the early stages of my research design and data collection processes, I was eager to understand the features, characteristics, and frameworks of Latinx cultural centers in hopes of identifying the ideal model of these spaces, the most effective of their type, buying into this notion that Latinx cultural centers had a magic potion or wizard wand to solve the crisis of failed Latinx college students. But in fact, it was during my second interview with Pedro, one of the directors, where in an exchange of a reflection about our experiences as Latinx student affair professionals, I realized that I too was replicating behaviors and ideas bound by harm producing politics and who I thought should be responsible for the work of Latinx students. It was in that moment that it became clear to me that Latinx student success is much more than a student outcome or a set of individual characteristics either develop or possess. Latinx student success is an institutional commitment to enter into relationship with Latinx students, families, faculty, staff, and communities, and to do whatever possible to do right by them. You cannot work towards a future with a community or repair a rupture without creating the conditions for their humanity to thrive alongside yours. Likened to a chiropractor uh, adjustment that seeks to achieve alignment, higher education as a system needs to acknowledge its self-inflicted chronic pain syndrome resulting from its roots in ind indigenous genocide, enslaved labor, and colonial agendas that are tucked away within the vertebrae of cultures, policies, and practices that hold tight to whiteness as both a means and an end. Will universities ever be ready to engage in a difficult but necessary work of dislocating and relocating? What are the indicators and signals? Latinx cultural center staff and students that engage these spaces reveal the possibilities of creating ecosystems necessary for Latinx student success to be birthed, not from struggle alone, but also from liberation. I offer the following implications categorized by areas of impact, theory, practice, and policy. Implications for theory. In grounding the study in critical race theory and critical race spatial analysis, I am reminded of the need to forefront spatial analysis and spatial equity in critical discourses that work towards justice-centered futures. Interrogating the work of directors and the engagement of students with Latinx cultural centers provided an understanding of the tensions and possibilities of racialized spaces on campus. In fact, the campus unit itself is a racialized space, not merely a backdrop to educational experiences, but central to the ways participants were afforded the opportunity to thrive. Secondly, implications for practice. Inspired by Harper's analysis about the need for universities to help all students develop a critical consciousness about racism as a system in the US, I argue that liberatory student outcomes, often referred to as non-cognitive variables or social emotional outcomes, should be the central um, charge of universities, and particularly within formal academic classroom settings, not just reserved for co-curricular spaces. However, I caution the process by which we define and assess for liberatory student outcomes, which I argue should not be the focus of institutional efforts. Bettina Love stresses the harmful implications of insisting that dark children need to need do not have or can function on, on character alone, which is misleading, naive, and dangerous. Liberatory student outcomes have the potential to ascribe to the narrative of character education, sources by which Latin minority students learn to adapt and to survive. In doing so, the need to assess for liberatory student outcomes has the danger of replicating the culture of assessments of conventional metrics, which ultimately places a responsibility on students to succeed, as well as delegating failure to them without working toward equity and justice. Instead, institutions must be willing to invest in creating opportunities that legitimize liberatory student outcomes that are already engaged, nurtured, and flourish in spaces such as Latinx cultural centers. Implications for policy. Time and time again, directors described how their centers were underfunded, defunded, understaffed, and under-resourced, while still being held accountable to institutional priorities beyond the scope of their work. To feel undervalued was an understatement for the ways directors process and negotiated their personal commitment to do right by their students and their capacity or lack therein of to do so. In most cases, centers depended on donations or strategic partnerships on campus to have the opportunity for their programming and services to stay afloat. In fact, at one campus, the director had to advocate for the inclusion of an assistant director for their center to be included in their institutional HSI application, not to hire a new staff member but to rehire the assistant director that was fired the year prior after a reorganization of cultural staff occurred. 
the city reveals the need to reinvest resources into Latinx cultural centers, including but not limited to increase in pay and promotion for current staff, increase in center monetary resources for hiring of new personnel, the compensation of voluntary staff, and sustainability of programs and services. And then lastly, Latinx uh, cultural center administrators in the study emphasize that they already know and uh, know and do the work of welcoming, protecting, nourishing, and investing in their own. Although the study did not focus on the tensions within and across the work individuals and departments that support Latinx students, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the division, tension, and traumas present in these spaces. Thus, while identifying best practices to do the work of serving this can be informative and borderline performative, this study inspires a bigger need to strategize and amplify these pre-existing efforts beyond the ivory tower. Our core social political climate requires us to make this shift. Participants reminded me time and time again that higher education was and continues to be a system that was not created for us to thrive. Let us look towards partnerships with local campus communities, collaborations across the state, and coalitions countrywide to build Latinx futures independent from the constraints of conventional metrics of student success. Does, let us leverage Latinx alumni networks to advocate for the transformation in our communities. We cannot depend on higher education to build futures for our students, for ourselves and our prosperity that will dismantle whiteness. And in closing, as Dr. Wheaton Love reminds us, education cannot save us. We have to save education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for, for, your, for your presentation. I wanna open it up to us all. Um, yeah, just, just take a look at the screen filled with um, applause and, and love. So um, I now wanna open it up to anyone who is, has a question or comment for Vanessa. Can, you can unmute. Hi, everybody. I have a question. <laughs> uh, my name is Denise. I'm Vanessa's older sister, but younger looking. <laughs> um, <laughs> first, I'm so mm. proud of your work, Vanessa, because it really shows that familial gap that the political climate, the social climate, the racial climate has placed on families who are in a country that, you know, whether it's the cultural or the language, we're missing that. So it's so important that these Latinx centers thrive and succeed. Do you feel that they will be needed, let's say in 20 years? Or do you think that the Latinx centers are training per se or molding the new generation um, to fill that gap. Yeah, thank you, Denise, for the question. And as uh, anyone who knows her personally knows that I'm already full of myself, and you can see my sister is more full of herself too. <laughs> it runs in the family. You have high levels of levels of confidence, thanks to her parents. <laughs> Um, but I think I really appreciate the question, Denise, and I think this is something that was really part of the conversation, not just only as part of my study, but just generally across like nationwide the conversation, like do we need these, these centers and or do they have a future in the space of higher education, right? I think I'll, I'll answer that in two different ways. You know, um, to one degree, I write in my research and in my study that for those centers who have a political, political history, right, that they were fomented and created by student activism, uh, with the intention for like liberation and freedom of Latinx students, their work looks really differently than centers who are created by institutions themselves, right? And who are grounded and oriented more towards the goal of academic success. Whereas uh, these ideas of liberation and these ideas of freedom are not part of their work and are not, not part of their goals, right? So I think for me, like um, to respond to your question, Denise, I think it really depends on the institution, right? Like these centers don't exist as silos, like they exist within a larger system and a larger environment, right? So for me, it's thinking about their origin. Like are some of these centers created through and by student activism 
Um, in the case of these centers, I really just see them so continuing that work because they've been working really hard to sustain themselves for these past years. You know, in some cases, these centers have operated through no funding through the institution for 50 years. And so I, I really do feel like these centers will continue to sort of work on that pathway. However, do I think their work will be limited? Yes, if we don't invest in them, right? We're losing a lot of talent. We're losing a lot of our, our student care professionals. We're losing a lot of our students, right? So the need to like invest in those is really critical. And I think for these spaces that, uh, of centers that are already institutionalized, right? There in some cases, the institution itself created these centers primarily in response to and in preparation for um, like a changing student demographic or an HSI application. These centers look a little bit differently, I distinctly. And so for me, I feel that since they already began from an institutional perspective, they are rooted in institution, will have that funding and will have those resources to begin. However, I think the implications of their work will look really differently, right? So will, is there a future for them? Yes. Um, is the impact of the work going to be different? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Claudia, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to get Zoom to raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, congratulations, Vanessa. It's always great to hear your work. Um, I wanted to see if you could say a little bit about the healing aspect that you um, wrote about in your dissertation. I was, I'm intrigued by that piece because at times I don't feel like that in higher ed we make a lot of space for that. Um, and I think it, it, and I think about it around Latinx students, but I also think about it amongst like white students, um, and that there's a certain need for you know these healing practices, especially as we do a lot of this racial reckoning. Yeah, Claudia, thank you again for joining. I appreciate the question. And I'm wondering, is there a specific aspect of like healing that you are really interested in understanding further or that I can describe further? Yeah, well, it's, I just saw it as part of your dissertation that it said that it's a, a component of it. So I, I hopefully I didn't misunderstand that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It really is, right? So I think one of the things that I, uh, uh, that I took away from directors was that their goal, again, wasn't to transform higher ed. Like that was not their goal. Like their goal was to quote unquote, like get students out. Like that was their goal, right? And to get them out to their fullest humanity. Like that was the goal of these directors, right? And different approaches, but that was the same goal. And that approach is really rooted in their own uh, harm and hurt and trauma from their own experiences of navigating higher ed as Latinx students themselves, right? So a lot of the programming and services of what they did was really uh, in terms of like free grounding students in terms of like identity, grounding students in terms of cultural practices, free grounding students with guest speakers who spoke about these issues of, of like recentering the self, about mental health, right? So a lot of the work was formed by that specific orientation. So healing was really central. In some cases, some centers were bold about the healing being central to the work. For instance, at one center, one of the directors uh, was known for doing like spiritual practices of like limpias, of like all these other things. And so students would literally come to the center and ask this person for a limpia, right? So engage in like curandera work with them, right? In other spaces, healing wasn't necessarily part of like a cultural practice per se, but it was part of the discourses. And so uh, as part of my study, I observed a course for an entire quarter, right? And while again, the conversation wasn't necessarily about healing, it was about from um, preparing and preventing harm, which for me is an aspect of healing. Right. And so for me, you know, the directors or instructors are mentioning how what they what their goal was for, for students to come out of higher ed less hurt than they did. Right. Yeah. And so for me, like it was really like that function that uh, they knew that the system was going to harm students. Uh, but again, that their investment wasn't in changing that system because it, nothing would change the system, according to these directors. Right. That their investment wasn't the student. And so I go further into detail with the study regarding how that healing was, was how that healing work right, took shape and place within these centers through the programs and services, but mainly through the directors. Thank you. We have a question from McCall, Dr. Carolina. Um, thank you, Vanessa. Super powerful work and um, on a topic I care so much about. So I just really appreciate your work so much. And um, actually my question um, comes from um, follow-up to the question your sister asked you, and, and I think you hit on it a little bit both in answering her and in answering Claudia, which is, you know, I'm really interested in um, when um, centers like 
like these can can really intersect with structural policies and and issues at, at the university that are that are um, going to be around um, disrupting or kind of fixing harm rather than just repairing it and at the margins. And so I just would love your I'd love your um, take on when you see kind of work that um, these centers do that can implicate you know influence policy more directly at in higher education in a way that. Um, maybe it doesn't make them go away, as Denise said, like in you know, like in twenty years, or as you suggest, but that really actually tries to repair some of um, the harm that that students come to these centers to sort of address, whether it's in their own, whether it's in courses or in, with faculty or in other ways. So basically, are there kind of policy recommendations that are really about changing the structure of higher education that you learned um, from your from your work? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kurlander. I think that's a great question and I do appreciate it. I think one of the things that your question is bringing up for me is the fact that these centers, uh, well, the majority of these centers were firmly rooted in not just doing the work of Latinx success on campus, but doing that within the local communities as well. So these, direct, these centers had a strong relationship with the local communities, particularly the Latinx communities, right? And so again, like the work of the centers was not just at the university, it was bound by a larger geographic area, right? So for me, it's really reminding me uh, of a lot of the work that we do at the, at the Transformative Justice Center, right? In terms of doing school community partnerships. And so for me, in thinking about like policy work, it's rethinking the ways in which we're engaging, again, not just our students, but engaging our communities that we're located in, right? How are we doing our work in service of our communities? How are we engaging our communities to come in to and serve as, um, as like scholars, to serve as part of our partners within initiatives, right? Um, to help us lead and guide assessment. So for me, like it's critical and the center showed that without a community partnership, not only were they not going to have a sustainable effort, but not only they were not going to have a future, right? Like their future depended on the local community, right? And that was adamant that, you know, in many cases, many of these centers were, were targeted by institutions and thus received a lot of defunding or demotions or firing or reorganization of staff. But in the case where centers had a strong connection with the local community, and local government, they had a sense of a sense or a different level of protection, if you will, right? And so, in doing so, that was your livelihood, right? And so, for me, in thinking about policy, it's really in that direction. It's thinking about engaging our, our local policies, engaging in sort of the, the work that they also need to see. And, and again, in many cases, like making our campuses a backyard for them, because they are a backyard, right? But how many cases do our communities never come to our campuses, never engage in our talks? How many times is our work not in service of the communities or in languages that they can really uh, understand? For example, even with my presentation today, I was really um, oscillating between using certain terms or not because I, I was like, man, I, I want this to be work that can be understood by anyone. And when Dr. Um, Dr. Davis still always reminds us that if your grandmother can't understand your research, then you're not doing the right work, right? And so for me, it's thinking again about like, are we doing the right work with the right people? And will our policy be able to lead us into that direction? Thank you, Vanessa. I want to thank you all for being here again. And if we can turn our cameras on so that Vanessa can see who's here just to um, lift her and, and celebrate her as she wraps up this dissertation. Um, again, I want to appreciate you all for being here. And I want to um, welcome you all back next week to um, highlight the work of Dr. Claudia Escobar, who is on here. Um, so we look forward to her presentation next week. And um, thank you. Thank you all.